Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of What's New in Prisma version 3.10. Uh, my name is Alex, and I am joined by Austin Prim, my fellow co worker. Um, uh, you've probably not seen him before. So, Austin, could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, my name is Austin. Uh, I'm a developer success engineer uh, here at Prisma. So, you might have seen me in our GitHub discussions or GitHub issues in the past. Um, but yeah, I started relatively recently and um, I'm excited to be here with Alex, uh, the professional What's New in Prisma streamer here to, to help me along as I do my first co-hosting duties. Thank you. Those are really kind words. We're not going to speak of the past, but yeah, thank you for the kind <laughs> words. <laughs> cool. So today's stream will be fairly short. So not short, uh, we have three items on the, our agenda. We'll go through the release notes. Um, after that, we will be joined by one of our colleagues, Matt, who will take us through embedded documents. And finally, um, our, our Prisma's friend called Peter, Peter, he'll join us and talk about Snaplet. I hope you're excited. So yeah, so let's go ahead and get into it. I'll share my screen. Uh, And you'll let me know if I'm sharing the right screen. Yes. Uh, moment. Bring it all to, to the stream. Yep. Change the nameplates. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So version 3.10 went out last week on Tuesday. Uh, we had a lot of features and breaking changes. Uh, however, they mostly affect the MongoDB connector. Uh, the first one is the embed, embedded documents, which is currently in preview. Um, as you can see, if you're using the MongoDB connector, um, you can start using the type keyword connector and reference it in your model as an embedded document. Um, on top of that, the queries are also type safe and we'll have Matt joining us who will speak more to the feature. We also enabled um, introspection for embedded documents. So if you have an existing project that's already using embedded documents, you can go ahead and run NPX Prisma DB pool and um, your schema will be um, populated with the different uh, embedded documents. Um, there's a breaking change where we changed uh, um, DB, um, the DB generated uh, to DB auto just to be uh, closer to the what MongoDB offers. And also the many-to-many -many relations now requires a, a reference. If it's too small, uh, Austin, uh, let me know if, so if I can zoom in. Yeah, yeah, if you wouldn't mind just bumping up a little yeah. bit. Yes, Thanks. so uh, many-to-many -many relations now requires a reference for ID, which is, um, I believe, should be the, the other post. Um, and finally, I believe we the db.array object ID was now updated to use the um, db array object ID is now updated to be db.object ID. Um, if you update upgrade to version 3.10, um, the Prisma extension should tell you uh, what uh, the different um, keywords to use in your schema. And of course, we have a bunch of other improvements and so many PRs uh, or issues were closed um, in the last sprint. And that is just about it. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and bring um, Matt to the stream. So I'll stop sharing. Yep. Yeah, let's and bring him in. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, moment. Matt, how you doing today? Uh, I think you're still muted, Matt. Yeah. I am muted, thanks. Hey, uh, Alex, <laughs> hey, Austin. I'm doing well, how are you guys doing today? <clears throat> good, good. Yeah, we appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today. Uh, Matt is is our colleague over at Prisma. He's a product manager on, on the Prisma client, and he's gonna talk to us today about uh, the new embedded documents feature, which I know a lot of people have been clamoring for, uh, for the, the enhanced MongoDB support. Um, so Matt, I think without further ado, we can just jump into to whatever demo you wanted to show us today. Yep, that sounds good. Um, so maybe I'll first uh, start with the uh, documentation. So we just yeah. released, uh, oh, actually, let me share my screen. Uh, whoops. Yeah, let's bring it up. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. 
cannot. We will add oh. it. Ah, uh, there we go. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I'm in the infinite. There Can you go. see everything? Okay. Yep. Cool. Yes. Um, yeah. So we we um, released uh, composite types, which are like basically our word for embedded document support in in MongoDB, and um, we've got some documentation on it here. Based. One of the neat features about this that is kind of unique if you're coming from like Mongoose or the MongoDB driver is that it's all kind of declared here and all type safe. And you can actually infer this from the your existing MongoDB database. So if you've got a like an existing app or something, you can run uh, Prisma DB pull and like populate this. There's a few tweaks you'll need to make. Um, you'll need to add the relations yourself because we can't infer that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, we the 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 crux of the feature is uh, you basically get these these new type uh, this new type keyword in your Prisma schema to be able to define these embedded types, and then you use the embedded types, uh, yeah, in your models basically. And so what this is saying, so maybe the difference, calling out some of the differences here, like the color, like we we had color before that was like an enum and that was it's kind of embedded too, like but it's it's very limited. Like it's it's just it's just strings basically. Uh, same with sizes. Um with orders, like th that's like just a traditional relationship where you've got like a foreign key pointing to to an order. Uh, but we've got this new one that refers to types which are embedded types and it's kind of as you'd expect. It's an, it's an array of objects within within the product itself. It works with uh, like two ones and optional two ones as well. So like the way to kind of think about this is like orders or yeah, orders contain one shipping address or orders may contain one uh, billing address. And then this one would be like products contain many photos. Um, I'm I can share a demo now. Do you wanna? Is there any questions um, that anybody? has about this feature before I kind of dive into the demo? I don't, but I think I today just learned that you can have an array of an enum. I've never seen that. I always expected oh, yeah. it to be, yeah, one-to-one, -one. yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, th I think for my, just like for my own clarification, so if we're looking at the product model there, like the difference between, um, say, orders and then the, our, the new feature with the photos is, um, orders is its own model, which would correspond in MongoDB to like its own collection. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, and then, yeah, photos in, in Mongo wouldn't actually be a collection. It'd just be like a nested uh, uh, array of objects within the uh, product. Collection. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And pre previously, that was just like a loose JSON definition where you could really put anything in there and you weren't really sure. What yeah, exactly. Was in there. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, you could, so the way people were kind of working around this before was they'd call this just like JSON or whatever, and then you can kind of, it wasn't type safe, it, it worked, like you could embed whatever you wanted in there, but it it wasn't, you, you didn't have a lot of operations, like you had equals and not equals, and you had a few like JSON filtering operations, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was pretty limited. And so this is kind of taking it to the next level where it's like type safe now, um, it's kind of defined in your schema properly. That's enforced, and uh, and also you get a whole bunch of operations that I'll, I'll show you. Yeah, yeah, that's really awesome. I know it's it's been one of our most highly requested features since we since we started with with JSON definitions and, and Mongo support. So uh, that's very exciting. exciting. Let's get into the demo. Yeah, uh, cool. So I'm just gonna walk through a, a bit of code. So um, I forgot to mention before, but this is like this schema is reflecting the same one in the docs, but it's a kind of an e-commerce app. So like you've got a You've got products that you create, and these products can have colors. They've got a price. Uh, they've got sizes, available sizes. They've got some product photos, uh, they, and then like there's orders that contain the products. Basically, like an order links to a, a product. Actually, if this was real e-commerce, it'd probably be multiple products. But uh, just mm -hmm. for demo purposes, it's simplified a bit. Um, and then yeah, you, uh, an order has a shipping address, and it may have a billing address. Like if Oftentimes, if you don't have a billing address, the billing address is the same as the shipping address as you've seen on, yep. on uh, other e-commerce sites. And um, yeah, and then we define uh, two enums here for colors and sizes, and then we define two uh, embedded uh, document types, uh, the photos, and they have like the defaults work here as well, and uh, and then an address. Yeah, cool. so that's that's the uh, schema. Um, one thing to note is you don't 
you don't get this type support unless you're using the preview feature of MongoDB. Actually, let me think. Actually, Matt, would you mind zooming in a little bit on your VS Code? Uh, okay, yep. Thank you. Um, I think, so maybe it's MPX Prisma validate or format. Hmm. You shouldn't be able to use the types actually if you've uh, disabled the preview feature. So mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure, maybe it's the provider actually, but uh, let me try to change this to Postgres just really quick and seeing if that, yeah, okay. So okay. if the, it only works, these embedded types only work for uh, MongoDB right now. We actually have plans to, uh, to, um, to actually make this work in other other platforms too. So in mm -hmm. Postgres and stuff, but uh, that's, that's a bit farther out. Uh, cool. So I'll just kind of walk through some of the, let me just run generate again. And uh, yeah, this is available in, in 3.10 and up. Uh, mm -hmm. So you'll need to, you'll need to upgrade. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to kind of walk through some examples here and, and get, give you a sense of kind of the operations that we, we support here. So I've cre created a bit of boilerplate code, just like resetting uh, the products and orders each time. And then, so then I'll run like, let's create our first product. Uh, TS node index.ts. You can see kind of like the, the photos come back as part of the, the product. They're embedded within the product. And let's maybe add another one here. So like, uh, you can see like, everything's kind of type safe. Uh, the height and the width are actually optional because we've defined defaults here. So let's see how that looks. Cool, yep. So we've added a, a new product. Uh, create menus also work as expected here. So you can, you can do like embeds within, like a create menu operation. See how that looks. So with these queries, you, you get the autocomplete as you're doing the, the operations on the embedded types, but you also have um, the results are actually fully typed as well, right? Whereas in the past, it would just maybe get any type or a, or a record. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, you see on the inputs, you get all like full autocomplete, but then mm -hmm. also, um, yeah, that's uh, that's worth showing here. Products, products, oops, come on, VS code. Products, zero. Um, uh, something is. I think we have another oh, product defined. Yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then like photos, height, and it's like you know number you are a uh, string yeah. number. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. So yeah, that's that's. Thanks for calling that out. That's important. Yeah. Um. Cool. Yeah. Let's then. So like you, we've got a whole bunch of other ones. So I just went through kind of like contains many, and now I'm going to show you uh, contains one. So it's again, kind of as you expect, you're just passing mm -hmm. an object in here and um, with a shipping address. And again, this is all like type safe and stuff. So even if, if we're missing something that's required, it will complain. Um, and then yeah, like autocomplete kind of works. We do have like other operations you can perform. So like an equivalent of like a kind of, I was using the shorthand before, but this is a basically equivalent is, is using the set operation here. Um, yep, that one is that. And then so we'll say we wanna add like a, um, a billing address. Uh, actually this example is a little bit off right now. Uh, we, we can add like a, whoops, the billing address as well. And that's been optional, and it's been set to null in the in the previous examples. But uh, we can also set a billing address. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pr pretty pretty straightforward stuff here. Um, let's get into some more interesting things. So, say we have a an existing order like this one. And we want to just update the zip code of that shipping address. So this is where we start to be like, okay, wow, like uh, this is, does a lot more than what JSON uh, filtering does, basically. So again, this is all kind of type safe here. We're 
updating this orders in like sh uh, embedded shipping address. So let's see if that works as expected here. Yeah, so you see what we created it with, it was 84323 and now it's uh, 41232. So um, you can get kind of deep, deep in there. Interesting. Right. I have a question. Um, yes. is, is it possible to have a type inside an embedded document inside an embedded document? Yes, you can actually. Um, so I could define something like this and let me just what doesn't work right now is uh mm -hmm. relations like you, you can't do this i mean you could do you could model it with like foreign keys and like but there's not really a good ui um developer experience for kind of like jumping through relations and stuff um, but you can totally do this so now uh, as you see that we need actually a address mm -hmm. here and so that cool that's kind of what question. i did yeah. And also a follow-up question, how many levels deep can one get with embedded documents in Prism? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried too deep, but uh, I'd imagine it's infinite because, I mean, I don't think we would arbitrarily stop it. Um, so, yeah, it's that's homework for you. Get, go okay. make it, make it a super deep one. <laughs> cool. I'll, I'll go break Prisma tonight, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, cool. So let's let's show a couple more of these um, just to get a flavor. So this is like this is a pretty crazy one. Um, we're upserting a billing address. So within an existing order, the billing address can be nullable, right? So it can be either mm -hmm. null or have a billing address. And so we actually can have an upsert within that. And so an upsert basically says if the, it's null, uh, set it to this. Otherwise, update it to this, basically. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, it's a little bit hard to, oops, I'm going to generate. I want to run TS node index. It's a bit hard to demonstrate this one because I'm resetting it each time. Like in this demo, it doesn't really work too well. But like um, if you if you ran this multiple times, it, would, it wouldn't be updating these anymore. It would just be updating this one. Right. Basically. So. Yeah, so in general, like in the previous um world where you just had like a plain json type like really your only option was to overwrite the whole field right like you, yeah you, you really didn't have any control over the nested properties especially not in a type safe manner exactly um, and the yeah. same thing with, with reading or like filter you'd, you'd have to try and filter on on a path and if yep. the path was wrong then your query just wouldn't work like you would you wouldn't really get get the the autocomplete or any anything like that so this kind of brings the the json fields up to the the same developer experience standard that we're used to with regular uh, models, which is really cool. I think I think yep. people are really gonna like it. Yep, that's right, and it's it's also kind of unique too. Like I haven't really seen this in the rest of the Mongo community, and so I'm like yeah. I'm excited to see how people, uh, yeah, like basically use it. Mm -hmm. um, so like we've kind of had this tension with Mongo where it's like. Uh, you know, you know, like just you want to just throw data at Mongo yeah. and just like let it save whatever. But it seems like from what we've talked to like larger companies and stuff like that, that are using Mongo in production and like, they don't actually want that anymore. Like it's good for like slinging code in the beginning, but like uh, after a while you actually do want a bit of structure. And so mm. we are kind of providing that structure to, I would say like the masses of Mongo people now, like this is like one of the first offerings that, that does that, I would say. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool just to have that option. Like, it, yeah. and you can always go back to a plain JSON field, right? If you needed to, you could revert back if, if you had a use case for that, but this Yeah, exactly. Like you could just do this, yep. mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool. Cool, yeah. Um, let me show a couple more if, I don't know yeah. how we're doing on time, but um, yep. I assume streams can go <laughs> however long. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we only, I only got like two or three more. So um, there's some other operations you can perform. So like, uh, say we wanted to add a, up, like add a new photo, basically. We've got an existing product. We're going to update that product, and we just want to push a, a photo onto the end of it. Uh, you can do that. So let me show you how that looks. Uh, yeah, so you see, like, a, this is now at the bottom here of, of what we've created. Selects and everything kind of like includes also work. All that stuff it, it works as as it used to. Um, yeah. So, um, 
Yep. And then let's do one more here. So uh, I just this one is just kind of to show you that upserts also work. Um, like the top level upsert works as, as expected, but um, like, so an, an upsert in this case would be like, we've got this winter shoot snowshoes. We're not sure if we've created this in the database or not. We just want to either like uh, create it or, or update it. Um, mm -hmm. It's not, a, this isn't a super good example, but um, cause it's kind of doing the same thing in both of these. But um, as you can kind of see that like the, photos and all like all that stuff still works as expected um, right. embedded embedded documents um they things change a little bit if depending on if you're updating or creating um so in this case it's not like that but um like if i change this to i think if i change this to update it would it like that would be okay but um let me try to see what Photos. One second, I'm just playing around with this first. Interesting. Hmm. I'm actually not sure why I'm seeing all of these options here, but um, oh, maybe, oh, it's because it's like this. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a bit of nuance. All I'm trying to say is there's a bit of nuance between if you're updating or creating, like not like, let me scroll back up for a second here. Like push operations don't really make sense if you're creating, but they make sense if you're updating. Right. So you yeah. won't be given a push operation for creating. And so the whole thing, the whole point is it depends on if you're in the create block or the update block. This example is not very demonstrative of that because it's it's the same for both. But yeah. um, sometimes you'll just need to kind of keep that in mind is it's, it can be different uh, depending on which one you're in. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. And then hopefully autocomplete and, and TypeScript will help you out there with those differences. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, yep, that's that's basically all I wanted to show today. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any, any questions or um, anything I can try to clear up. Yeah, yeah, very cool. I think a question I had, uh, it's something you mentioned uh, at the beginning that this actually um, will actually work with with uh, the DB poll command and doing introspecting on an existing uh, Mongo database. I you don't need to show anything or have, have anything any demo prepared, but I'm just curious, like how how that works under the hood with the way that uh, MongoDB traditionally works with very unstructured, untyped data. How Prisma is able to um, construct a model uh, out of an existing uh, MongoDB database? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And something like we weren't sure that we were going to be able to even do. Yeah. Um, so it works quite a bit differently than than SQL. With with SQL, you like the actual structure is stored within the database itself, and it's also enforced. It's got something called uh, like like data integrity. Mm -hmm. MongoDB, um, you can kind of insert whatever you want. It's kind of up to you as a developer uh, in your application code to make like make sure things that data is consistent. But mm -hmm. you also, if you don't want data to be consistent, you can do that with Mongo mm -hmm. too. So um, with with the way the MongoDB poll works is it actually like it reads um, some of the the collections and it like infers the types and it, I think it does a sampling. So it's not going to just go through your entire database, but it's it's going to like read the first 10 of each of each collection or something like that and be like, oh, is this this address is an object. Okay, let's let's go into this object and be like, oh, there's a zip code in here. Um, sometimes the zip code's an integer and sometimes it's a string. Uh oh. Like so mm -hmm. in, that, in those kinds of cases, we it's really a best effort. Like we're not like I can't sit here and tell you like you run MPX uh, DB poll and like if you have an inconsistent database, like it's gonna, it's just gonna, like we're gonna magically be able to figure things out. Yeah. What happens is um, we pick the most popular one that we've sampled. So like mm -hmm. we'll pick um, if if zip code is most often a number, but sometimes is a string, we will choose it to be a number. But then we write a comment above it that says like we've we've encountered a number. Um, or we've encountered a string like 10% of the time or something like that. Um, and then I think we also print a warning in the console as well. Um, so that that is um, a bit of a tricky thing. It's like I would highly recommend if you can to actually try to make your database consistent at that point because we're still working through like if, if you do a find many on 
on addresses or something like that, and there's numbers and strings, and you've told Prisma that it's a number, if you've encountered one with a string, it will throw an error. So mm -hmm. yeah. um, that, that's one of the pitfalls right now that we are th trying to think of how to improve, but there's not a clear way to, a clear, obvious answer to improve that, um, right. other than like force people to like make it, you unable to query until like you've resolved all your data, co your inconsistencies, which seems yeah. like a really high bar, um, yeah. especially if it's like only 0.1% of them are inconsistent. Maybe we can show people like where it's inconsistent. That could be one, one option. But if, you, if it's a huge database, we're not reading all the data. So um, it's a bit of a tricky problem. Yeah. So it's definitely best effort. Uh, I, I know that's a longer answer than maybe you were, you were wanting. But, um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a good way to start, like um, get the ball rolling quickly with right. Prisma, but right. like you don't expect it just like it to be a magic ball. You run that command and you can just like, if you've had like a database that you've had for years um, and just be able to like get rolling with Prisma, you, you might need to do a bit of work. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's, it's a really cool um, idea anyways in the first place to kind of start reading the database and even getting that information back, like as the developer, like, hey, your your zip code field has some integers and some string like that's that's useful information anyways so yeah so that is a good way to just get the ball rolling um and get getting a little bit of insight actually on on where you might have some data integrity problems in your in your mongo that's right, yeah and it's funny because even though even the example um databases that mongodb provides they mm -hmm. also have data integrity like <laughs> issues so um it's, it's, it's pretty issue. common yeah it's pretty common <laughs> Yeah, very cool. Alex, do you have some questions for him? Yes. Uh, while you're presenting, I had one of those shower thought kind of question where I was asking myself, can you have a recursive type, you know, address reference referencing itself? Is it possible or should it be possible? Um, I think it should be possible. Um, I, I would assume, so I don't think they could be required. Like it would have to be optional because otherwise it would be required, 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 required all the way down. Um, but I think you could have an optional one where then like, like it, for the billing address example I use, like you could put a billing address, an optional billing address inside an optional billing address. And then like at some point down the chain, it's null and that's fine. Um, that mm -hmm. should work. It's worth, worth trying though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, is there a limit to the size of an embedded document by the way? Oh, that's a good question. I I don't think we impose any limits, but I think Mongo may. So that mm -hmm. would be something that you might want to um, look on, like the MongoDB documentation about. Cool, cool. And uh, from a theoretical perspective, is there any performance implication when you read and write your data using an embedded document instead of a relation? Um, there should, like embedded documents, should be a little bit more performant because the data is local um, mm -hmm. as opposed to kind of reaching across collections. I would, yeah, I would leave, like maybe leave it at that. I'm not, I'm not sure I haven't done any performance mm -hmm. benchmarks, but I think that's kind of the point of being able to embed, embed. Like that's one of the reasons NoSQL exists is so you can kind of choose between these, like having the data local within, within a, a record or mm -hmm. having it kind of like, uh, tying with relations um, to, through through different tables. Cool, and um, since you mentioned that we're going to, we intend to support with uh, JSON uh, types, do, do we have a theoretical um, like insight on how this would look like? Or... Sh our hope is that it looks exactly the same. It's like literally a layer on top because it, MongoDB itself isn't enforcing any of this type safety, any of this stuff. It's all all Prisma, and like at the end of the day, we write from Prisma writes to Mongo just like a random JSON blob, basically. Mm -hmm. And so we could do the same with Postgres and MySQL. Uh, anybody, any database that supports JSON, we could um, theoretically uh, support. We haven't dug into the details yet, but our design is meant to kind of be able to broaden at at, at some point. Um, and the reason this is important also is because a lot of people are asking for PostGIS support and PostGIS support has these kind of composite types uh, and we want to be able to kind of take what we're doing with Mongo and apply it to, to Postgres and, and PostGIS as well. Yeah, I think that's a really exciting implication of like not only for 
having this this strong typing capability with Mongo, but this new type keyword in the Prisma schema is maybe going to enable some stuff down the road, um, even from traditional relational databases, being able to pick out pieces of your models that you're maybe repeating or being able to reuse types kind of across different models. And then, like you said, with the post GIS stuff. So it's very exciting that we get this, we're going to play around with this new, this new stuff. And please, uh, anyone watching, give it a shot and, and feel free to give us some feedback. Yeah, I want to underscore that point, actually. So we're actually trying to release Mongo in production in about a month. And so if now is the time, like we are like ears very open, like if like if you give this thing a shot um, and like have any problems with it, we want to fix these things immediately. And yep. um, if you've got any ergonomic issues where it's like this is really annoying, um, we want to try to fix those stuff like ASAP, basically. So we're very responsive to feedback, especially right now. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Anything else, Alex? Uh, that is all from me. In case I get any shower thoughts, then I, I'll ping you on Slack, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks so much, Matt. We really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, absolutely. To everyone watching, give it a shot. Reach out to any of us, and we'd, we'd be happy to, to get back to you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Alex. Thanks a lot, Austin. Thanks, everybody. See you, Matt. See you on Slack. Bye. Sorry, uh, got into a uh, risk condition right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, moment as I change. So uh, we have one final guest who's a friend of Christmas. His name is Pista Peter Silius Pistorius. Uh, he's been working on Redwood JS and also a co-founder of Snaplet, but I will let him introduce himself. So I'll bring him up to the stage. Uh, hi. Hey, Alex. Hi, Austin. How are you doing, Peter? Super, super well. It's really nice to be described as a friend of Prisma. Good I, uh, friend. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, uh, like when we created uh, Redwood JS, I think Prisma, we were one of the first frameworks that used Prisma. Mm -hmm. And we were still using it back when the binary was called Prisma 2 um, <laughs> to be compatible with the old Prisma. And uh, I've experienced many breaking changes, and I'm still a super fan. I don't think the the developer experience can be can be matched um, that we're having in Prisma. That's awesome. We appreciate um, the kind words. Yeah. So so I'm on a farm in the middle of nowhere. My internet is not the best. So I'm going to give a demonstration. Uh, if it goes sour, I'm super sorry. I'll record it and um, uh, post it somewhere. But I'm going to turn my video off just to conserve bandwidth. Yeah. Um, no problem. And um, cool. So I believe, uh, Peter, you have a demo for us. Um, oh, he just shared his screen. I'll bring it up to the stage and switch things up. Um, yeah, this is where it gets confusing, uh, having to switch the brand. Uh, yep, yeah, sorry for the confusion. Yeah, there. There we go. Perfect. OK, so I've already introduced myself. Um, so I'm going to skip that slide. but. Um, one second. Today, I'm going to be talking about seeding your database with Snaplet and Prisma. Um, but what does seeding your database mean? Uh, this is you. You're a developer. You have an empty database, and you're hungry for data. Uh, one way to do that is to seed your database. The idea behind seeding your database is that you want to easily set up a development environment that's filled with data so that you can code against it. Uh, so one way to do that is to create a seed script. A seed script is a file that creates each row in a table in a database. It's super e easy to introduce a seed script into a project with Prisma. Um, I'm going to show you a demo of how to do that real quick. Um, but first, I just want to show you my schema.prisma file. Uh, we have a model with customers. We have name and email in there. Um, and if we look at our database in Prisma Studio, you'll notice that it's completely empty. So what I could do is add a record in here. And I know we all have done this when we're trying to code against something. We're just like, OK, let's get this going. Uh, but that's, that's not nice. It's, uh, it, it, it's not reproducible, reproducible, and I can't share it with the rest of my team. So another way of doing that is to use a seed script. So a seed script is this JavaScript file that imports Prisma. And from there, it, we, can, we can run some Run some things so I can say db. Let's await that db.customer.create. 
data name, and we can kind of do the same thing. Name, email, oops, safety here. And I can create two customers. Uh, so now I have the seed file that's creating these two customers and I can literally go and run that. I can type node prisma seed, yes. And that data will be inserted into my database. Um, but we want to kind of, oops, what have I done? Discard my changes. There we go. But we want to we want to integrate this with with Prisma. So one way of doing that is through this Prisma seed um, object and key in your in your package.json file, mm -hmm. where you tell it how you want to run your seed file. So then you can run npx Prisma seed uh, Prisma DB seed. It'll run my seed file for me, mm -hmm. and it'll insert the data into my database. Um, And, and that's it. Seed scripts are awesome, but they're something that you and your team have to maintain over time. As your project grows, so does the complexity of your seed scripts. Um, it's not a feature, it's not a bug, and I think that you shouldn't really have to care about this. And that's where Snap it, Snaplet comes in. We introduce an alternative approach to seed scripts. We fill your database with data, and the data that we're providing is free from effort. But uh, how does that work? So right now, Snaplet works for teams with some data in production. What we do is we connect to your production database. We copy the rows out of your database. We transform them based on a configuration that you provide us. We store that as a file. And then we give you a CLI interface that you can restore into your development machine, your staging machine, or into CI CD. Um, I'm going to show you a quick demo of how that works. Um, so let me show you. This is my production database. It's a pretend production database. I have some customers in here. Um, and I want to copy these rows. I want to transform them. And I want to restore them for usage during development. So what I'm going to do is connect this to uh, Snaplet. If you go to www.snaplet.dev, uh, you can connect your production database to Snaplet, which I'm going to do now. Oh, all right, I'll skip that step. Um, and then I get a data. I, I get to access the data editor where we can run operations that transform your data. So the one that I'm going to focus in on today is replacing column data. So here's our customer table, and we have an email, an ID, and a name column. If I click on that, it gives me a suggestion for values that I can replace. So I can either create my own ones, like name at example.org, or I can use a dynamic template, uh, internet.email. Um, I'm going to add that one. I can do the same for name. So here I want to have name.first name and name.last name. Please, that can be Just, replaced. Sorry for, uh, to interrupt, uh, where do where are the templates from? Is this a configuration from um, Snaplet? Um, they come from Faker, but oh. we have this DSL. So one of the features that we're going to introduce is the ability just to run an ordinary JS function as a callback, where mm -hmm. you'll actually get the you'll get access you'll get access to the rest of the values in this in this row, um, and then you can just do whatever you want. Uh, so right now this DSL is mm -hmm. is what we have, but it comes from Faker. Um, so I can save that configuration, and then I can create a snapshot. So I'm going to kick off a new snapshot. Um, so Snaplet is now connecting to your database. It's copying all the rows, uh, mm -hmm. transforming them, and saving them. Um, whilst that's busy happening over there, I'll show you how to restore this into your development database. So um, in order to use Snaplet, I can I can type Snaplet Alice, and I can list all the snapshots that are busy being that are there. I have some older ones, and I have one that's busy being created right now. Um, and I can restore that. And there's a, a flag that works really well with Prisma, which is dash dash data only, because ordinarily we restore the structure as well as the data. But with Prisma, Prisma already brings the data, the, the structure. So we're going to bring the the um, the data. So I'm going to type snap that restore dash dash data only. Um, it's still busy down. Uh, it's still busy over here. So whilst it's busy working. Is he booting? This is a perfect demo. 
because <laughs> this is actually my local database. So it should have finished, should be finished by now. But what I'm gonna do is delete that snapshot and I'm just gonna restore the one that I created earlier. So, oh, okay, it's now done, perfect, great. All right, so now I'm gonna type snap and restore dash dash data only. Um, I, I downloaded the tables that I just created and I restored it to a C database. So now if we head on over here and I refresh it, um, it's introduced all the fake, the fake data for me. So um, these are not my production values. They're, they're different. They're, they were uh, generated on the fly. Um, uh, oh, one last thing. You can introduce this uh, to, to Prisma uh, to the Prisma process by simply replacing this seed script with snap and restore dash dash data dash only. Uh, and then when I type something like um, npx prisma migrate the db reset, is it migrate reset? I can never remember. I think it's migrate reset. But here it's, it's like, you're gonna lose all your data. Oh, why did that fail? I don't know why that failed. And yeah, it's a I, live stream. I, I'm not, I'm not going to debug that, but that's the idea. And it will restore your data whenever there's an operation that wipes your database. So um, uh, so one thing I just want to point out is that we're currently in open date beta. We haven't delivered all the features uh, in exactly the quality that we want, uh, but we're working on data generation. So in other words, if you add new tables or add new columns, we can generate data for you if you don't have any. Um, or if you don't have a production database, or if you don't want to give us access to your production database, you'll also be able to self-host the snapshot capture process and keep your data in your own network so that we don't have to connect to your production database for you. Um, uh, thanks. I, I, I enjoyed this more than I thought I would. And my heart rate is currently 130 per minute. <laughs> or is... <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Cool. Thank you for the presentation. Really interested in Snaplet. Yeah, this is where I usually have to figure out, um, you know, when uh, um, bringing someone off or taking off the screen, how to do it both at the same time, which is kind of sometimes nerve wracking. But yeah, we figure it out. Um, but yeah, um, I have to say, I really like the illustrations, um, especially on yeah. Twitter. I see Snaplet cut a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, if anyone can guess the name of the mm -hmm. cat, um, I will send you some free swag. So, wow. Uh, I uh, okay. Uh, can we get any clues? Um, I, I'd like to win it now. <laughs> yeah. If you go to the um, careers page, I believe that you will be able to see. Uh, Snappy is a member. Oh, geez, I just gave it away. <laughs> uh, Snappy is the CEO of Smiles and Naps. And uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give anyone swag out of mind. <laughs> just PM, DM me on Twitter. Yeah. Cool. Alex, we have I, for him? Yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, was uh, Snaplet, of, given that you're using Faker to generate the random data, were you affected by the Faker outage that was there a few months ago? Yeah, well, so we actually, um, we create a Docker image and we only release when we uh, increment the version. So we avoided it, um, but we've already moved over to the to the, the fork. Um, yeah, yeah, but that was that was quite interesting. It was an interesting time. It's a crazy like situation. The version number was 6.6.6. .6 .6. Yeah. <laughs> it was weird. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, and does, it's more, this one is more of a meta question, but does Snaplet run on Snaplet? It does, yeah, yeah. All our all of our tests run against Snaplet data. When we debug scenarios, we mm -hmm. use Snaplet data that's de-identified. It's it's a wonderful experience to be able to code against realistic data. Mm -hmm. um, takes away a lot of anxiety. Cool. Yeah. And finally, my last question, unless you have any, Austin, but uh, do you have like an example GitHub action to show what this would look like in a preview or in a production? environment uh, not pr of course you wouldn't use a seed dating production but yeah um in a preview yeah um no we don't i i but i'd, I'd love to get one going 
That'd be great. Uh, cool. Um, Anthony has a question. And do you strip do you strip out your own private info? Do you have an answer yes, to we that? Do. We do. Yeah. So um, uh, we use Auth0 to log in. So we take away all the authorization tokens and we just start from scratch. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So we do. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I know, like, as as someone that's experienced um, in my career, like having to maintain a test data set, um, it's not fun, <laughs> especially as as your app grows in complexity. It's just it adds another ticket on your on your board of, of something to keep track of. And then um, recently, with the legislation in in, in Europe with the GDPR um, and similar stuff in California, I know that protecting um, personally identifiable information is, is, is a huge thing. And a lot of big enterprises are having to deal with, uh, with the ramifications of that. So it, it's really cool to see like that integrated flow of being able to not only set up a really smooth development environment uh, with Snaplet, but you're also taking care of all of that uh, the regulatory and, and privacy stuff as well, uh, just built in. I think that's really cool. Yeah. And I think uh, you, us as developers, we kind of care about privacy. It's, mm -hmm something that we're aware of and we're trying to inform our family and friends about it. And then some of us are walking around with like production databases on our, on our laptops <laughs> and it feels bad. Um, so I'd like to take that, that anxiety away and give people the ability to, or give developers the ability to self-service their data needs. Um, but like to really have the power to do that, not to have to rely on a, on a, on someone else to say, yeah. Hey, DevOps person, the dump of the database is broken. Yeah. Where did you upload it to? Oh, S3, is it, is it available on the internet? Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. yeah. It's really cool like to see that like database seeding and like that concept that isn't something that immediately jumps to mind when you think about something that's really integral to developers workflow, but it really does touch a lot of parts where you're talking about dealing with local development, testing, like Alex mentioned, maybe CI, CD, um, I can see having a really nice tool like Snapple that integrates well in your workflow to just really smooth over all those edges where you can um, just have that production-like data when you need it. It's a very cool idea. Thanks, Austin. Yeah. yeah, I'm super excited to introduce this to the market. Yeah, and one final question, which I have asked you before, but just for our audience, do you intend to expand Snaplet to cover other databases? Because I think it would be, it's a really essential tool. So uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we do eventually uh, want to expand to other databases, but right now we are only supporting Postgres. Um, yeah, we have a narrow focus, but um, yeah, we'll expand eventually. Cool. Do one thing well and then expand to the rest. I, yeah, kind of. Yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Uh, thank you for joining us, Peter, and I'll see you around. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cool. Uh, so Austin, I think we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, we are going to answer. Yep, we could answer. So yeah, uh, let's start with for Filmcoin asks, uh, how do you rate DBs for Prisma, RDS, Heroku, Superbase, Hasura, uh, PlanetScale, and MongoDB? Yeah, well, that's a tough one. I, th I think the classic answer is it depends, right? <laughs> it, it all depends yeah. on, on your use case. And, and the nice thing about Prisma is, is we have compatibility with with a, a wide range of, of providers. So I know Planet Scale has been been a really hot topic lately. It's been getting a lot of hype and, and for good reason. It's a great technology. Um, but yeah. yeah, at the end of the day, it depends on what, what you're looking for. If you want to set up and manage something all on your own, like something... Uh, with with Amazon RDS, or if you want more of a managed solution, mm -hmm. um, it's it all depends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, personally, I'd say just go with what works for you. Um, the simpler, the better. Uh, if you're new to the whole concept of databases, um, but yeah, pick whatever's the simplest. Yeah, um, to just get up and running with. Yeah, for sure. Cool. And another question from Filmcoin on whether we have an update of the Nexus plugin. Um, do you have any response to that? I'm actually not sure what the latest is on the Nexus plugin. I, would I know we have a few colleagues that are really involved in that, but I have not kept up. Uh, neither have I, but 
um, hopefully the engineering, we can't commit to anything, but hopefully the engineering team picks this up um, sooner or later, yeah. yeah. And for Filmcoin also asks another question, uh, which one have you successfully used in production? Well, I know that there are production workloads on any of those types of databases people have been successful yeah. with with all of them. So, so like Alex said, um, it just depends on what, what you want to try, what you're comfortable with. Um, I personally um, use, have used Supabase, I've used PlanetScale, I've used Mongo all successfully. So my advice is just give it a shot and, and see where it goes. Yeah, um, mine's going to be a little unpopular, but it's Azure SQL, which is SQL, hosted SQL Server. Um, it's a little expensive, but um, I wasn't the one paying, so why not? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, uh, but I think uh, simplest, the simplest one to get started with could be either PlanetScale or MongoDB because they offer pretty generous free tiers, I think, but you can easily uh, get up and running with. And a little teaser for one of my projects, I'm using MongoDB so that I can try and break the um, the preview uh, feature because I'm, I'm mostly excited to break it, yeah. <laughs> cool. cool. I think that was all for today. Um, yeah, uh, we will see you on the next one. Thank you for hosting this with me and ciao. Yep. Thanks, Alex. Bye, everyone.